Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having an incredible day today. In today's video, we are going to be covering another Mystery Monday case, except it's not a mystery. This is a solved case. We're going to be talking about a serial killer, a Russian serial killer, who was dubbed the Granny Ripper. Before we do get into it, today's video is brought to you by our sponsor, Casetify. You guys may know the new iPhone 14 is out. You may have it. You may not have it. Either way, Casetify's new iPhone 14 impact cases have over 20% increased protection. Protection. They are embedded with Casetify's latest protection technology called EcoShock, meaning they provide protection for drops of up to 11.5 feet, which is five times the military standard. And all the while still keeping the phone cases really slim, they still have such a large range of cases which are personalizable. They're still MagSafe and wireless charging compatible and 5G compatible. So whether you guys do have the iPhone 14, whether you're upgrading or not, you can go to Casetify's website to check out the new iPhone 14 cases, or you can check out their iPhone 13 and lower and different models on their website and you can also get 15% off if you go to casetify.com slash Bella. So I will leave all of the information for that in the description down below and let's go ahead and get into today's case. So Tamara Samsonova, also known as the Granny Ripper, was born on the 5th of February in 1947 and she grew up in the small town of Uja in Russia. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. I did look up how to pronounce it, but I just can't grasp it. So maybe I should just... Ujur. 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 Anyway, Ujo is part of the Kransiyarsk Krai, which is the largest Krai in Russia. And from my understanding, a Krai is basically like a territory. And Tamara had quite a few nicknames. Obviously, she was nicknamed the Granny Ripper. I'm sure you're wondering why. It was a play on, obviously, Jack the Ripper. But as we get into this case, I'm sure you'll understand why they kind of nicknamed her after Jack the Ripper. She was also given the nickname Baba Yaga, which is a reference to Slavic folklore. And basically, Baba Yaga means like evil old witch. And what's so interesting about her being named like the Granny Ripper or, you know, Baba Yaga, Evil Old Witch, like these really kind of brutal nicknames is it's such a contrast to like her image. She's like this sweet, innocent, older lady, like grandma type feels. She's just like a really unlikely perpetrator, like not somebody that you would point the finger at, not somebody that you would think is capable of such horrific crimes. I really could not find much information about Tamara's upbringing or her early life or anything like that. It pretty much starts from after she graduated high school. She went on to study at the Moscow State Linguistic University and then after university she moved to St. Petersburg where she met her husband, a man named Alexei, and he was working in a car repair plant and Tamara, after graduating, worked at a travel agency and then went on to work at the Grand Hotel in Europe, which is actually a really famous hotel still to this day and it really is grand like the name suggests. Anyway, after Tamara and Alexei met, they ended up moving in to a Dmitriova Street apartment together. Fast forward to the year 2000, Alexei and Tamara have been living at the same Dmitriova Street apartments for about 30 years now. They've been together for about 30 years and in the year 2000, the St. Petersburg police were called to this apartment because Alexei had been reported missing. And so Tamara is still living there. She's living there alone and the police are like, hey, where's your husband? And she's like, oh, you know, he ran off with another woman. She didn't really have any evidence to back this up, but the police had no reason not to believe her. And Tamara was devastated. She was devastated that her partner of 30 years had left her and run off with another woman. So the police just believed her. By mid-2001, there's still no sign of Alexei. No one has seen or heard from him. And it's been about a year since he kind of disappeared by this point or ran off with this other woman. And so Tamara's starting to feel lonely because she's had someone to share a house with for 30 years. And now she's been alone for a year. So she decides that she wants to fill up some of that space and get a roommate in. And she finds a guy named Vladimir to move in with her. But he ended up moving out very shortly after moving in because it was kind of a volatile roommate sort of situation. They had a big falling out and he left. And this seemed to be a sort of a theme for Tamara where she would get roommates in, they would have a big falling out and then the roommate would leave. Neighbors said they often heard her like screaming, swearing, banging on the radiator. Like obviously she was not a pleasure to live with. We don't really know the names of all of the roommates or the order in which they lived with her, but she had several. Usually her roommates were men who were slightly 
slightly younger than her because she was nearing 60 at this point. One roommate that we do know that she had in 2003 was a guy named Sergi Patanian. And similar story to Vladimir. He moved in, they had a big falling out, and he moved out shortly after. But this was described as like a really abrupt move out like he just was gone and he was from another town so everyone just kind of assumed he packed up his bags and just left really quickly by 2015 tamara is 68 years old at this point she's enjoying her retirement but her house is vacant as in she's still living there but she doesn't have any roommates at the moment and her house also needs some renovations and some repairs to be done which requires her to move out temporarily so she had a friend who helped set her up to move in with this other woman named valentina Ulanova and she was a little older than Tamara she was 79 and she just so happened to live on the same street as Tamara so it was a great setup for Tamara really easy for her to get from point A to point B and in return for living with Valentina she was just gonna provide some assistance around the house great setup and you know with Tamara's wonderful track record with roommates what could go wrong a few months past Valentina Tamara still living together I have no idea what stage the renovations are at at Tamara's house but I suppose it didn't matter anyway because Tamara decided that she just was happy with the arrangement and she wanted to continue living with Valentina forever and she was refusing to leave. And Valentina, I mean, you know, I'm sure you guys are aware by now that Tamara is an absolute nightmare to live with. And so Valentina was like, that's not happening. And so they started to argue every single day. So in July, they ended up having this massive argument over whose turn it was to do the dishes, which you would think is like just kind of your regular roommate sort of argument. Argument. But to Tamara, it definitely was not because she ended up on the 23rd of July going into the nearby town of Pushkin and she went into the pharmacist and convinced the pharmacist to sell her a prescription only pill called Phenazepin, which is a Russian made schizophrenia medication. And in large doses, it acts as a muscle relaxant. It can also, you know, cause overdoses. And she managed to convince the pharmacist to sell her this pill over the counter. And on her way home from the pharmacist, she stopped in at the local store, picked up one of Valentina's favorite meals called an Olivia salad, which is just like a Russian potato salad. And Tamara claimed that she crushed up and put an entire packet of these Phenazepan pills into this potato salad, which is 50. She claimed she put 50 crushed up pills in the potato salad. I don't know if she was like exaggerating because I have no idea how Valentina wouldn't have tasted that, but she served it to Valentina for dinner. Valentina ate it and Tamara went up to bed. She wakes up at 2 a.m. and finds Valentina unconscious on the kitchen floor. And just a little word of warning, but things are about to get a little bit graphic. So you might want to skip ahead if you are sensitive to that. Or I will put like a little timestamp on the screen for where you could skip to. So once Tamara discovers Valentina's unconscious body in the kitchen, she began to dismember her with a hacksaw, even sawing her torso in half. She also used kitchen knives for the more delicate sections. And and she then started putting all of these like body parts into these little plastic bags. And there's two really disturbing things about this. I mean, the whole situation is disturbing. Like the fact that this woman let Tamara into her home and provided her with shelter, you know, it didn't seem like she really made her pay anything. She just asked Tamara to assist around the house. And Tamara is repaying her by trying to take over her house and then killing this woman. But not only was she doing that, it later came out during the autopsy that Valentina was likely still alive when this happened. She was unconscious. I don't know if she felt anything, but she was still breathing when this happened. And there was also CCTV footage of Tamara taking these bags with Valentina's body parts and taking them outside so that she could dispose of them in the pond behind the house. And if that wasn't bad enough, she also placed Valentina's head and her fingers into a large saucepan and boiled it, which you can see as well on CCTV, her taking that out the back so that she can dispose of that in the pond as well. There were also some conflicting reports that these like head and fingers that she boiled ended up in the communal rubbish bins rather than in the pond behind the house. And Tamara is nearly 70 at this point. So it's crazy this, you know, the CCTV footage of this sweet kind of innocent older lady taking these plastic bags outside and then later discovering 
discovering that it's a human body in there that she has hacked up by herself. It's like a lot of heavy lifting as well for a 70 year old woman. It's just not something that you would expect. So a few days later on the 27th of July, a couple who lived on the same street as Tamar and Valentina were out walking their dog and their dog was acting really weird and it became obsessed with the pond behind Tamar and Valentina's house. And so the couple kind of took their dog to go and investigate and see why the dog was acting so weird about this pond. And that's when they discovered human remains, some of which had been wrapped or covered in a shower curtain. And they immediately called the police who quickly began their investigation. They started by interviewing neighbors and doing a sort of head count to see if everybody who lived on the street was still there, if there was anybody missing. And Tamara was in the clear at this point because she had boiled the head and the hands so they couldn't identify the remains. And they had no reason to suspect this nice, innocent, sweet 70 year old lady until they got a report that somebody on the street had seen Tamara taking garbage bags out really early hours of the morning. And this was also coupled with the fact that in their head count, they realized Valentina wasn't there. And in speaking to some of the other neighbors, nobody had seen or heard from Valentina in the last couple of days. And so the police decide to go to Valentina's house where Tamara is obviously still living. And they question her and they're like, you know, do you mind if we come and have a look around and Tamara says yeah you know come in have a look around my house and inside the house police find evidence of blood spattered around the bathroom the kitchen and a missing shower curtain obviously looking pretty incriminating um, but turns out it doesn't matter that it looked incriminating they don't actually need the evidence because Tamara just admitted it. She told police that Valentina had insulted her and so she was forced to kill her. And so they had an admission Tamara had killed Valentina, but that was just the tip of the iceberg in this case. So Tamara was arrested and she was really calm during the whole ordeal. She didn't show any signs of stress and her first hearing was held on the 29th of July. So two days after Valentina's remains were found. And during this hearing, she once again admitted to killing her friend and even expressed relief over the fact that the conflict between them was now resolved. She was captured blowing a kiss to photographers and said, this is such a disgrace for me. All of the city will know. I mean, it's just really weird because you have no remorse over killing this woman who was nice enough to take you into her home. And you're only concerned not about the fact that you murdered her, but about the fact that the people in the town are going to start gossiping about you. Now, also during this hearing, Tamara admitted or basically admitted to killing a bunch of other people. I quote, I was getting ready for this court action for dozens of years. It was all done deliberately. There is no way to live. With this last murder, I closed the chapter. When the judge asked her about what she thought was a fitting punishment, she said, quote, you decide your honor. After all, I am guilty and I deserve a punishment. So she was ordered to be held in custody while the investigation was ongoing about Valentina and I guess these other murders now that she's like kind of semi not explicitly admitted to. And in response to this sentencing, Tamara looked at the judge smiling and applauded it, applauded the decision. After the hearing, police took Tamara to Valentina's house where she basically took them through everything that happened that night and a step-by-step -step of the dismemberment. And I will spare you most of the details, but one thing that I will mention that she did say is the reason that she boiled Valentina's head and her fingers was in an effort to try and conceal Valentina's identity. And what also came to light around this time is that it may have also had a little something to do with cannibalism as well, because while she did try and explain that it was because of, you know, the fact that she was trying to conceal her identity. That doesn't explain why all of Valentina's organs were missing and nowhere to be found. So after Tamara has explained everything that happened that night with Valentina, they took her back and remanded her in custody again while they continued to investigate her. And this is when they found a very detailed diary of Tamara's that had all of her basic information in there, like her schedule, her dietary information. It was written in three different languages. It was written in English, Russian, and German 
women. So I don't know if she like, when she was writing this, she expected that one day she would be caught. And so she wrote it as in as many languages as she could so that, you know, the most people would be able to read it and understand it. But also in this diary were very detailed accounts of at least 10 different murders that she had committed over the last 20 years. And so it became clear that Valentina was not her first victim. It was more like her last hurrah, her final victim. And so the police had a lot more investigating to do. And after all this information about the diary came out, this case really blew up in the media. You know, it was insane that this sweet, innocent, older looking lady was capable of something like this. It's just not something you would ever expect. She's not the type of person you would suspect of these terrible crimes. And so the media really latched onto this case and this is when they dubbed her the Granny Ripper. So police continued their investigation. They were looking through the diary thoroughly and they also went to question Tamara to kind of verify these murders. And she ended up admitting to 13 murders that she had committed over the last 20 years, some of which were hard to verify due to the age of the cases and also due to the victims that she would choose. She would often choose people who were from out of town so that they wouldn't really know anyone in the area that she murdered them. There wouldn't be anyone to report them missing or notice that they weren't there. One example that we spoke about earlier was Sergi Patanian, the guy from out of town who moved in with her as a roommate in 2003 and then abruptly moved out. Turns out he did not abruptly move out. They got into an argument and then on the 6th of September in 2003, Tamar actually poisoned him in a similar manner to Valentina and then dismembered him and disposed of his body parts as well. And police actually did discover his torso on the street, like at around that time, I believe, but they couldn't identify who the torso belonged to. And so it just remained unsolved and nobody really knew that he was missing. So they couldn't connect the dots. I'm sure you guys are also wondering about her husband, Alexi, because if you remember, he, you know, randomly moved out one day and then the police came and questioned her about it. And she said, oh, he ran off with another woman, but then he was never seen from or heard from ever again. Well, she has never admitted to murdering him and there's no information that has been released to say that she wrote about it in her diary. I mean, the whole diary has never been released. Only photos of certain pages have been released, but police did come out and say that they suspected that she actually did murder him. So I don't know if there was something in the diary that's just never been released or if there's any information to kind of allude to the fact that she did murder him or admitted it, but apparently she's never like outwardly admitted to murdering him. Police just suspect that she did. This part might be slightly confusing because I believe some publications got some of her victims confused, but if you remember her first ever roommate was a guy named Vladimir and he moved out. You might be thinking that she murdered him, but turns out she actually didn't, right? So right after he moved out, police found that he had been admitted to hospital with poisoning symptoms, but he was all right. He didn't die, although it seems like she did try to murder him. Where it gets confusing is that in her diary, she actually does talk about murdering somebody else also named Vladimir. She wrote, cut him to pieces in the bathroom with a knife, put the pieces of his body in plastic bags and threw them away in different parts of the Fronzensky district. So she did murder a guy named Vladimir, but it wasn't her first ever roommate that I spoke about earlier. He actually did survive, although it seems like she did try to murder him, but it really does seem like she had this method down pat because she got away with this for 20 odd years. Now the real question here is motive. Like what made her do this? Why is she killing these people? Like people for no reason, honestly. Honestly, what was the reason behind killing Valentina? I mean, obviously I think she wanted to move into a house and Valentina didn't want that. But all these men, like these are victims that she allowed to move in with her from out of town. So she didn't know them. She didn't have any vendetta against them. There was no reason for her to murder these people. So what was the motive? So it came out during her various hearings and psychological evaluations that she did have mental health problems. And she was quoted as saying to reporters, I'm haunted by 
a maniac upstairs who forced me to kill. It's alleged she may have had some degree of violent schizophrenia and this could potentially be the reasoning behind her committing these murders. It turns out that she never needed any renovations on her house. No renovations were ever done to the house. The reason she wanted to get out of there was because she wanted to escape the voices in her head. It came out that she also had an interest in reading black magic books and this actually led the police to believe that some of these murders may have been like ritualistic murders or part of a ritual. Like I mentioned earlier, there was also some suspicion that she was a cannibal. She wrote in her diary about being on a diet of lungs, legs, and heads. And then she would like get rid of the rest of the body. And in her final victim, Valentina, the lungs were never found as well as some of the other organs. Tamara's neighbor, a woman named Marina Kravenko, also came out to say that Tamara was apparently obsessed with the violent story of Andre Chikatilo, who is also known as the Butcher of Rostov. He was a violent rapist and murderer who was also known to eat parts of his victims. And some Russian media outlets even compared Tamara to this guy, saying that she was a female version of the Butcher of Rostov. So it's believed he may have directly inspired some of her murders. Let me know if you guys also want a video done on the Butcher of Rostov as well. So anyway, toward the end of the investigation, it was suspected that she could actually be responsible for upward of 21 murders and police were trying to link her diary entries with body parts that had been found around St. Petersburg. To be honest, we'll never know how many people she really murdered because she's admitted to 13, but police suspect she could have committed as many as 21 murders, maybe even more. And it's crazy because over 20 years, murdering as many as 21 people potentially, and she's never been caught. She's never been suspected. She's never been looked at as being a murder suspect. And she was committing these murders well into her 60s, you know, like lugging around body parts. It's just crazy. She was obviously very careful with how she did it. She was obviously very meticulous about removing the bodies and removing any evidence so as to not ever get caught. And, you know, her appearance as well, you know, being this sweet lady and as she got older, being this sweet older lady must have really helped her fly under the radar because nobody would expect it. In the end, there was only enough evidence to charge her with two of the murders and take her to trial for two of the murders. But unfortunately, this trial would never happen and she would never be convicted of these murders because she was deemed unfit to stand trial. Instead, she was ordered to spend the rest of her life at Kazan Psychiatric Hospital where she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. So unfortunately, there's never going to be you know, accountability for any of these crimes that were committed. And so there'll never be any real closure for the victims and their families. Some of these families might not even have any confirmation about what happened to their loved one. Some of these people are from out of town, so their loved ones might think that they've just gone missing and then that's as much information as they have. It really is heartbreaking and my heart just goes out to all of the victims and their families and everyone who was affected by this. It's just crazy that there are such evil people in our world. But that is everything for this case. That's all from me today. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below and we can have a chat. But that's everything from me today. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye!